Support for Conversations with Elle McFarland was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, today's guest is Neil Loydolt. Neil is the president and CEO of the Minnesota Assistance Council for Veterans. They call it MACV. He joined MACV in February of 2017. He works closely with its board of directors, uh, the MACV executive leadership, the staff, and community stakeholders to establish and oversee the strategic direction of the organizational mission to end veteran homelessness in Minnesota. Now, since assuming leadership, uh, Neil has raised the public profile of MACV and the needs of homeless veterans while strengthening community support. Uh, this has led to innovative partnerships with housing developers, corporations, foundations, and media that bring MACV closer to achieving its mission. Uh, and most recently, Neil has served on the governor's task force on housing to address Minnesota's housing challenges and provide recommendations. His passion for serving veterans grows out of his personal military service. In 2017, he transitioned to MACV from full-time employment with the Minnesota National Guard. Additionally, he continues to serve as a deputy adjutant general, holding the rank of major general, where he is responsible for providing guidance, leadership, support, and oversight on matters pertaining to the organization's priorities. Uh, he began his military career in 1984 uh, when he enlisted in the Minnesota Army National Guard as an ammunition specialist. He received uh, his commission from St. Cloud State University Army Reserve Officers Training Corps in May of 1987. He served in numerous staff positions throughout his career and commanded at all levels of the division. His deployments include um, Deputy Director of Operations at Iraq Reconstruction Management Office, the United States Mission, Iraq, and Chief of Staff, 34th Infantry Division, United States Division, South in Basra, Iraq. His awards and decorations include the Distinguished Service Medal, Legion of Merit, and the Bronze Star. Uh, Neil is married to Cecile Loydot, uh, a shareholder in Brassford, Remelli, is that correct? Remley. Remley, okay. Right, yeah. And uh, their son, Sam, who's a senior at University of Minnesota. Neil, first of all, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your service. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be in your company. And I can't tell you how proud I am to have a chance to connect with you for being a, a soldier yeah. and uh, serving our country, serving our community and with honor and with uh, valor. So thank you for being here. Well, th thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, you know, thanks for your service as well. And if I could say, I sure hope that my mom gets to watch this because that is by far the finest introduction I think I've ever had. And well, so thank you for that. I hope she's watching. So this <laughs> is being streamed live on Facebook. It'll be available on Facebook at the Insight Facebook page. And we're producing television shows for, that will be pre presented on SPN and TV in St. Paul and MTN TV in Minneapolis. And this will also be a radio program on KFAI radio. So we're using a variety of modalities to yeah. communicate, to tell this important story. An important story it is. You focused on serving the homeless veterans in Minnesota. Talk about that if you would. You know, um, we are a statewide organization, offices in Duluth and Mankato and a presence in St. Cloud and then um, outreach in the western half of the state where it can be so difficult, you know, to have a permanent presence. Um, the, the challenge is great uh, in Minnesota with over 350,000 approximately veterans in Minnesota. You know, Wilder uh, estimates about 4,000 homeless mm -hmm. veterans over the period of a, a year years time. Mm -hmm. For us, that means about 1,600 veterans that we helped in 2018 with housing services, um, employment services. Well, you, you've got to be able to sustain your rent. Um, you can't just have somebody help you. And so the job component is a really significant piece. And we maintain a 
just a wonderful volunteer network of lawyers throughout the state who on a pro bono basis mm -hmm. help us resolve small issues for veterans that keep them from stable housing, things like fines, fees, evictions, um, loss of driver's license, et cetera. Those are, those are items that make it terribly difficult for you to get your feet back under you again. What are you finding are the major challenges facing veterans, particularly those that have found themselves homeless? Is there a ranking or an order that you've discovered shows up in their experience? Well, about in about equal thirds of the veterans that we serve have either a physical disability, mm -hmm. a psychological challenge, or an addiction. And unfortunately, a number of them have two. Mm -hmm. And so a combination of those can make it difficult for you to navigate sort of the normal rental landscape. You know, in the metro area right now, there's just a 1% vacancy rate, meaning landlords can be selective and it's their right to do so mm -hmm. um, on tenants that they might take in. And so if you've got a if you've got a long list of problems in your past and you're not necessarily always the best tenant, it can be really difficult on your own for you to secure that housing. And so that's what our case managers do. They, they help veterans get um, aligned with housing. They try to help them work on whatever issues they may have that created a problem for their past housing mm -hmm. and put them on a, a long-term sustainable path for the future. How about the mental health issues and the medical issues? They manifest as well. They, they do, and in and, and that part of our population, we refer to the VA mm -hmm. for mental health issues and medical issues as well. So there's only 50 of us all in the whole, across the whole state, and we're very proud of this idea that we don't duplicate services. So where you can get your treatment from the VA, then we try to help you get it from the VA, or our great partners like Lutheran Social Services, Catholic Charities, Union Gospel Mission, uh, just a whole range of people help us help veterans get on track. And so that's the work of our case manager is as much trying to make sure a veteran is educated on what's available mm -hmm. to them and help them sort of enter these other systems that already so exist. So you're kind of a navigator. I, I think so. I think that's a very fair. directing, uh, encouraging yeah. veterans to find pathways to uh, completion, fulfillment, healing. Right. And sustainability in their lives, right? Sure. Yeah. And it's, it, is, it is a combination of what you suggested. It might be helping, it might be leading, it might be pushing, mm -hmm. it might be cajoling, mm -hmm. it, whatever it can take for you to help somebody, um, you know, get on the track again. Neil, I want to ask you how much of the challenge uh, that a veteran faces uh, is internal and how much of it is external? And, and I raise the question revealing my bias that that I think our society sometimes turns a blind eye. And it's easy for ordinary people to say, oh, that's not me, it's them. Right. And to walk away where there is need. But what do you think? Maybe I'm wrong. No, I, I think there's an aspect of that. I don't think that's unique to veterans. I think that would be um, across the homeless population, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes for individuals, it's a difficult thing to um, recognize and acknowledge a challenge if you think you can't be part of solving it. And so maybe sometimes, you know, I don't know what's in other people's minds and hearts, but maybe sometimes you think if I don't see it, then, I, then, then there's, not, there's not an obligation for me to be able to, be able to do something. But, but certainly we do know this, whether it's veterans or the homeless population at large, um, dealing with it on the right hand side after the episode of homelessness is significantly more expensive. It's a significantly greater challenge and it's harder on the individual mm -hmm. than if we could get to the left and try to help people stay where they're at or maintain their dignity and respect or not find themselves in a homeless situation. But, um, but that part of the spectrum is harder to, harder to finance. It's harder to resource. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things you've done is worked on creating more public awareness. Uh, how have you done that? What are you doing to educate the public so that people can put energy and resources towards the preventive and the sustainability side uh, while not ignoring the interventions that are needed as well. Right, I, I think the, the way to do that, the right way to do that is through education. Mm -hmm. And so while it's public awareness that's helped us get out, it's opportunities like this, um, it's partnerships with the Minnesota Twins, it's conducting our veteran stand down events downtown Minneapolis in, in near the Skyway system so that the 10,000 people at work downtown Minneapolis can see the face, mm -hmm. the face of the homeless challenge because behind every every name or number is a person, is a human being, mm -hmm. just like you or I. And I think the more people can realize that and can see that aspect of the challenge, uh, the, the better off we are. So we educate is what we try to do more than anything else. Use the data that exists, use cases of veterans that we've helped to show people 
that this is the challenge. And so this past um, summer when we had our event, it was at the Target Center, mm -hmm. and we were there on the second level, and at you know 7 o'clock in the morning, veterans started lining up. There was 150 veterans in line uh, coming up on 8 o'clock when everybody was coming to work. Mm -hmm. And you could see the reactions that you were just asking me about. Some people, you know, maybe try to look away mm -hmm. and just keep making their way through the concourse and over mm -hmm. off into the next. And some people stop and shake a hand or ask what's going on. I, I think that's how you get people to understand the challenge, but I also think that's an opportunity to show them that, uh, you know, it, it it's not doesn't take a rocket scientist type solution here. Mm -hmm. One veteran at a time, one willing citizen at a time to help, is the way we can do that. And one I handshake. think that shows it. And sometimes one, word, one gentle word, sometimes correct, mm -hmm. correct. Yeah, I uh, I <coughs> excuse me when I uh, wear my military gear, my cruise jacket, mm -hmm. uh, from way back when, actually it's one that my son-in-law got me, but I, I wear it uh, at the beginning of winter and I have so much fun wearing it because I get questions, I get um, you know, people saying thank you for your service, and I, I like that, you know? Yeah. And I think that uh, the community has changed quite a bit since the Vietnam War era, when I think it was more difficult to come back sure. as a veteran and you had this, protest environment that uh, I think um, you know, just uh, created and maintained a lot of uh, disinformation and confusion about the nature uh, of service, right. right? I think we've gone beyond that. We've come beyond that. I think people are seeing service and service men and women in a different, more positive and more proper light. What do you think about that? Is that, is that consistent with your assessment. I do. I, I think that's right. I think that's why education works. If the willingness is there, um, if the understanding is there, then it's it's sort of incumbent upon those of us who do the business to just help people along. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of meet your volunteer halfway, if you will. An interesting thing, though, I think, uh, about what you describe is that, you know, 20% uh, of whom we helped last year are in the Vietnam veteran category. Mm -hmm. For some of them, time has not still has not healed the wound. So even if the population has changed, even if there's greater goodwill, this is a group that, that doesn't feel like it's gotten a good solution sometimes. It is maybe a little more cynical about the VA or larger organizations mm -hmm. and isn't as willing then to accept help. It's very difficult to help somebody who is not themselves wanting to be on a path mm -hmm. to be helped. Let me ask you about your own personal career. I read some of that in the introduction, but if you talk about uh, how you uh, decided personally that uh, the military career was uh, the right career for you. What, when you were five or six or seven, uh, what was in your mind in terms of possibilities and careers? Uh, there wasn't, wasn't anything about the military, <laughs> in fairness, in my mind. You know, as I approached retirement here at the end of May, I was just, uh, I was wearing the uniform on Wednesday, another day of military duty to mm -hmm. sort of sign this, that, or the other thing. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to someone there and I said, I, some days I do wish I had that story, you know, that from the youngest age I, I played with this or I did that or mm -hmm. I read a book and I always just always couldn't wait to be in. But that, that wasn't the case. It was more of a practical thing for me. I was in college at St. Cloud State. I wasn't doing as well as I probably should have been. Here was an opportunity to, to join something larger than myself, um, you know, maybe make a little bit of extra money, finish college. And, and that's what, what I had intended on doing was to do my time. You mentioned your own enlistment, you know. You do your time and then you're done and you move on. But, um, but here we are 34 years later doing it two or three more years at a time. You're a lawyer too? I'm, I went to law school. Okay, and a... I do have a license, but, okay. but I, I'm not a practicing lawyer. No. Okay. No, okay. In the Army, I'm a field artillery and an air defense artillery officer. Why did you choose that area? So I was a field artillery officer originally because I had a strong mentor. Mm -hmm. A lot of us find ourselves where they are because they had strong mentors. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, it's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. I mm -hmm. think I got a lot of breaks in my military career. I had people help me uh, when I wasn't doing well or when I just needed help. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the veterans that we help haven't had that, right. right? They went left when the rest of us went right and no one was there to sort of help them along. And so in Minnesota at the time, the greatest um, density of officers were in the field artillery, and so there was a real selfish reason. If you want to have a chance to make it to captain, join the branch that has the most captains, uh -huh. okay. right? And so that's what led me to the field artillery. Um, about the time I graduated law school, they did suggest to me, hey, maybe you want to be an Army lawyer. Mm -hmm. But I was, a, I was a young guy at the time. I was really liking hanging out with all the other young guys mm -hmm. who were on field artillery pieces and doing really the hard work. 
of the Army, and so I stayed in I stayed in the operational side so that I could continue to lead and help soldiers and be involved. And I never did look back to see if I should ever be an Army lawyer. You've seen combat? I two tours in, in Iraq. Yeah. Tell me about the short story on the combat experience. Um, well, it's uh, everybody has their own experience. You know, it's it, you can't really know what to expect, and so the first time you do it, you, you you've learned everything, um, but then you you think you do know. And then you do it again and you realize even the second time is just Still like the first know. time right. yeah. all over again because it's a different location, it's a different assignment. You know, the first uh, time I deployed, I was an individual. I went to be the chief of staff at the reconstruction management office, just myself. Mm -hmm. They flew me down to Fort Bliss. I mm -hmm. went to two weeks of training. They put me on an aircraft. I was in Iraq the next day, mm -hmm. just that quickly. Mm -hmm. The second time when I was the chief of staff of the 34th Infantry Division, that was a year-long train-up mm -hmm. here at home. Mm -hmm. Same group of people, mm -hmm. same camaraderie, those that you can help. Everybody travels at the same time. You're there deployed at the same time. And so those, those how nuances large, how change large things. How large a group? So when, when I went the first time, me, second, second one, time, yep, yeah. second time, uh, <coughs> 1,100 wow. people. Not all from Minnesota because yeah. we had fillers and stuff, but that was the size mm -hmm. of a division headquarters. And you, you can do an awful lot of work. Mm -hmm with 1,100 people who are captive, <laughs> right? And no one's going home, no one's mm -hmm. driving anybody to soccer or anything like that, they just work. That's work. They work and they, can do, and they can do a lot of work. But I think you asked for a story, the thing that really struck me the, the most, still does, is for all of the differences um, when you go to somebody else's country, there are the similarities. Yes. Um, the, the challenges they have with their government looks like some of the challenges we have. Mm -hmm. And the challenges they have providing social services look like some of the challenges we have providing social services. And so if you, if you can get to the human aspect of what you do, um, you'll find out that we're not all, all a lot that different. So we're out of time, but this goes so quickly. I want to thank you so much. Uh, Neil lloyd Major General, Neil lloyd -Dolt. thank you so much. I want to close, though, with asking you to take a second to invite our listeners and our viewers to, to step up and step in. Uh, what can ordinary people do to support your mission, uh, your mission to support veterans that are homeless right now? I, I think, actually, ordinary people can, can do an awful lot for us. You, you pick, I say. You can donate your time, your treasure, your talent, some combination of those. Uh, you can s sign up and come to one of our events and be a greeter or help a veteran through the line. You, if that's not the thing that you do, you can, as lawyers and doctors and the rest do, you can offer your technical services and we'll try to aim those. Uh, you, can, you can send us $25 or $5 or, or $2, or you can do like a lot of our great partners do and provide that particular service. You know, we're working very hard right now with Comcast to take their Internet Essentials program mm -hmm and align that with low-income veterans. Awesome. I mean, anymore you can't really navigate the system if you don't have some digital literacy and some connection. And so it's a probably a pretty small thing for Comcast. It makes a big difference mm -hmm. for us and all of those little things for other people, you know, add up to help us get to the end of veteran homelessness in Minnesota. General, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Al. Right. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. I'll add a, a caveat here. You know, I've uh, been uh, talking and, and advocating for the African-American community that we, uh, again, encourage uh, our young uh, students and children who are potentially inclined to look at military service. I think it's a great thing. It's a way to uh, serve our country, serve community, but the benefits of serving are awesome. They're tremendous. And so I want to take a minute to, again, invite you to pay attention uh, as parents, as uh, brothers, sisters, mentors, but encourage our own to step up and to be supportive of uh, our country and uh, freedom. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. This edition of Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by Comcast, working to bridge the digital divide through internet essentials and partnering with organizations across Twin Cities to help make our region an even better place to live, work, and play. Established in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1994, 
uh, the inspiration for Tickets for Kids came to founder Susan Weiner during a ball game. The empty seats seemed so wasteful and so unnecessary. Couldn't these seats be filled by the community's disadvantaged kids? A nearly identical idea occurred in 2000 to Rob Neuenschwinder, a Twin Cities resident and avid University of Minnesota Gophers basketball fan. Frustrated that so many game seats went unused, Rob founded the Minneapolis-based Ticks for Tots to fill those seats with kids and mentors who could use them. Recognizing a shared vision and nearly identical missions, Ticks for Tots was merged into Tickets for Kids in 2016. So in January of 2019, another like-missioned nonprofit, the New York-based Seats of Dreams, was merged into Tickets for Kids National Network through partnerships with approved and vetted nonprofits serving disadvantaged kids and families, TFK, Ticks for Kids, has distributed more than 3 million tickets valued in excess of $64.1 million for experiences in arts and culture, in education and STEM, in sports and recreation, and family entertainment. In 2018 alone, the TFK distribution included more than 192,000 tickets valued at over $6 million, and it partnered with nonprofit organizations in 31 states. That's an impressive story, and I'm pleased to talk about what that means in Minnesota with my guest, Susan Murray. Susan Murray is the regional director, Twin Cities, for Tickets for Kids. Susan, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So this is a powerful idea, mm -hmm. and it's growing. And you can testify uh, about the importance and the power mm -hmm. of sharing and giving. Talk about that. Yeah, you know, Tickets for Kids really believes that experiences matter, and they matter for every child in our community, not just the ones privileged enough to be able to afford the opportunities like seeing a ball game, going to the zoo, going to the science museum, or even the opera or orchestra. So we really strive to make that available to every kid and impact and create those memories and spark an interest for every kid in our community. You have a particular interest in reaching underprivileged kids or kids in uh, ethnic communities. Uh, what's the story? Yeah, so we only partner with social service agencies, schools, and government programs that serve at least 70% low-income youth. Mm -hmm. So we really try to reach out to kids in every neighborhood of the Twin Cities and even greater Minnesota that just don't have the opportunity to leave their neighborhoods. We hear stories all the time of kids that grew up in St. Paul and have mm -hmm. never been to downtown Minneapolis mm -hmm. or grew up in North Minneapolis and never been to the uh, downtown St. Paul. Mm -hmm. So we really try to break down those barriers and get kids access to to all of these different experiences and our ticket donors utilize us for that purpose. You must have some wonderful stories about, uh, well you talked to me before the show yeah. about last night, yeah. actually yesterday, tell me about that again. That's yeah, a story. so our uh, generous supporter PNC Bank was able to get a meet and greet with uh, ballet artist Misty Copeland mm. last night. So last night we were able to bring eight wonderful little girls from the Boys and Girls Clubs mm -hmm. in St. Paul and they got a meet and greet with Misty. They got to wow. give her a hug. They wow. got to take a picture and then listen to her inspiring story about mm -hmm. how she grew up, grew up, how she got into arts and why arts are so important to, to every kid out there just to have them experience it. Any more stories like that? Uh, just uh, stories that open up you know, our minds to the value of uh, getting these experiences to families and, their, and kids. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, I have, I have hundreds of them. All of, our, all of our kids report back to us after every experience. Mm -hmm. I think one of my favorite opportunities was last February, February 2018, the Children's Theater do, was doing a production of The Wiz. Mm -hmm. The Children's Theater realized that this was a really important uh, opportunity for the kids we serve, for the agencies we serve, for a lot of the kids we work with to get people that look like them on stage mm -hmm. and really be inspired by mm -hmm. that. So we were able to get a few hundred tickets wow. to The Wiz donated to us. We don't purchase any tickets whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And kids from the community got to go to that performance and they said over and over and how inspired they were. And they brought it back 
back to their community. So even the kids and the families that didn't get to go, mm -hmm. some of the kids from a uh, neighborhood center in North Minneapolis set mm -hmm. up a movie showing night of the movie of The Wiz. Mm -hmm. And they had conversations about it and celebrated together. And it was just a fantastic cultural experience that the children's theater realized was really, really important for us to get out there. And they wouldn't have been able to reach as many people in the community as, mm -hmm. as we can with our network of 250 nonprofit organizations we currently work with. So that's a phenomenal multiplier effect yeah. uh, in several uh, ways, I think. One, you're getting to consumers, children, uh, giving them a chance to connect, but you're also affecting their family, sisters yeah. and brothers. You're also affecting the neighborhood because you're creating interest and conversation exactly. and engagement. And in doing so, you broaden horizons, mm -hmm. right? You open up the uh, the window yeah. of opportunity and allow children, encourage them to see the world differently mm -hmm. than they may have been able to do because they didn't have the access Absolutely. that other kids often have. Mm -hmm. And so you're demonstrating the power of access and you're demonstrating the power of paying attention yeah. to, you know, things we often take for granted, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't. Right. And you've created a mechanism for mm -hmm. intentional engagement mm -hmm. and support of children's dreaming, yeah. et cetera. So, you know, uh, you've got to, you mentioned some of your partners, mentioned some others, because it's great that companies step up. Uh, what are their organizations that you distribute tickets for? That's number one. Yeah. And I don't have any problem with you giving credit to some of your uh, sponsoring partner yeah. stakeholders. It's, I'd it's, love to. It's important to do that. Yeah, so uh, like I said, none of the donates, none of the tickets that we get are um, purchased. Mm -hmm. They are all donated to us. So we have partnerships with most of the major sports teams. The mm -hmm. Minnesota Twins are fantastic yep. partners of ours, the Timberwolves, the Lynx. Um, we've also partnered with both orchestras, the Minnesota Orchestra, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestras, the um, Minnesota Opera, the Ordway, the Hennepin Theater Trust, who all realize that they need to make their art forms more accessible mm -hmm. to different types of people. Mm -hmm. And that also makes sure the kids and the families feel welcome in mm -hmm. those spaces. So not just opening the door, but how do we make them interact and, and feel like they belong there? That's so cool. Yeah. And so it recognizes the shifting demographics. It does. The market of the future is different. Yes. It's browner. Yes. You know, it's multilingual, multi-ethnic. It is. And so you can't just look at who used to be in the audience and assume that they'll be there forever. Yes. It's change. Mm -hmm. And to the degree that an organization recognizes the change is coming and reaches out with intentionality again, yes. that I think ensures their both survival mm -hmm. and their the vitality yes. of uh, their mission of service and of creativity to the community, Correct. to the market that's growing. That's what I think. Yeah. But I think it's important too to have kids experience the opera, mm -hmm. for example. And so kids should not have the feeling that the opera is not for them exactly. or that the orchestra is not for them or that they can only be interested in rock and roll <laughs> or only in the blues, R&B, yeah. or pop. And so you're sort of building cultural bridges mm -hmm. in the process, right? Yes, absolutely. And the wonderful staff at the orchestras and the opera get that too. Mm -hmm. You know, the first time I reached out to them to see if we could provide these opportunities, they happily said yes. Mm -hmm. They happily said, wonderful, how can we get more kids involved in this? And how can we make it accessible? So that also means creating um, uh, frequently asked questions about what to expect when I go to an opera. When do I clap at an opera? When do I um, stand up? When do I go? What time do I show up? So all those educational purposes to That's make sure that they're re not... Real practical. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Keep going, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's great, that's great. Um, and then also organizations even like the Minnesota Zoo mm -hmm. and the uh, um, Science Museum of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. We've started relationships with the Bakken Museum as well in order to have the mutual benefit there of not only getting kids to the Bakken, but getting the Bakken to the community right. as well and promoting that for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, even our business partners in the community have actually really grasped on grasped onto this. So Urban Air Adventure Park in Coon Rapids is one of our best partners. They donate so many passes a month to allow kids into that space. Same with GameWorks at the Mall of America. Mm -hmm. um, Valley Fair will be a partner of ours this year. Super. So the, the business community says, you know what, yeah, we need to get every kid in here, even if they <coughs> can't necessarily afford it, they deserve to be able to enjoy our space. And it starts from a simple recognition from uh, uh, Susan Weiner and Rob uh, Neuenschwander. Yes. It's a shame to waste these seats. It is. There's this wonderful experience. 
there's this wonderful uh, venue, wonderful event, and it ought to be enjoyed. Yes. And we shouldn't let whatever it is that has these seats empty exactly. uh, stand. And so you reach out and you bring people in that should enjoy that. Exactly. That's a wonderful idea. How, how do you come to this work? What's your own personal story? Sure. So I actually started out working for about 10 years in residential treatment centers. Mm -hmm. So I worked with adjudicated youth that were kind of one step before prison. Kids that had a really hard upbringing, lots of mental health problems, um, chemical dependency problems. And I, I really fell in love with working with teenagers and mm -hmm. hearing their story mm -hmm. and, and helping them. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I enjoyed that. Um, after about 10 years, I needed a little bit of a change, so I decided to go to corporate for a few years. Mm -hmm. Learned a lot of really helpful business skills, really helpful marketing skills, mm -hmm. things like that, but felt a little bit disconnected from my community. Mm -hmm. um, so I went back to get grad school, got a degree there, and then found this perfect position with Tickets for Kids. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot believe that my job is to meet cool people <laughs> and make kids happy. but. Mm -hmm. It is, so that's pretty remarkable. So what are your degrees and what, what's your training? Yeah, so I have a BS in psychology from the University of Minnesota Duluth, mm -hmm. and then I just com completed my master's in public and nonprofit administration from Metropolitan State University. Okay. And so as you think about the work you've done and uh, develop your vision for your future, what are your hopes, your aspirations? Um, what do you want to deliver of value to community, to your yeah. profession, to your own training, yeah. but to humanity? That's a big question. Oh, what my your, goodness. What, what are your thoughts? That is a big question. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I started grad school is from working from nonprofits and seeing the resources that were available, available to nonprofits mm -hmm. and then moving to a large global corporation, there was mm -hmm. just such a divide in resources. Hmm. And it and it just broke my heart mm -hmm. um, that you know it was it was so hard to get all the resources to help kids that you know were really our future, but yet there was a lot of resources in in corporate that were being a little bit wasted. But I don't think it was intentional or even right. know that they were wasted. So I started my master's program hoping that I could bring some of my business skills to nonprofits and bring mm -hmm. some of my nonprofit heart to businesses as well. So I wanted to bring those together. Um, I think personally moving forward with Tickets for Kids is just the perfect opportunity to do that because mm -hmm. everyone thinks about the kids, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks of this is an amazing experience for kids, which mm -hmm. it is, and that, yeah. that is the first thing. But also, when I worked in nonprofit organizations, we didn't have the budget to take kids to a movie. We mm -hmm. could never take kids to a ball game, anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So being that Tickets for Kids supports about 250 nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm it really helps them too. So one of the mentoring organizations we work with has bluntly said to us, our program wouldn't work very well without your program. Wow. We ask mentors not to spend a ton of money on their youth, but mm -hmm. it's, it's hard for adults and kids to bond over mm -hmm. a table right. sometimes. Right. Sometimes they need a little something extra and some yeah. shared interests. So yeah. personally, it brings a lot of passion that we can help the nonprofit community in that way and then help the arts institutions, like we were just talking about, mm -hmm. the orchestras, mm -hmm. the opera, the science museum, all these organizations mm -hmm. realize that demographics are changing. Right. So we're supporting other nonprofits, right. right, which are the arts. And supporting, to, yeah. Yeah, so it's a whole ecosystem. Everybody wins. Everybody, yeah, everybody wins. wins. You know, yeah. this is kind of the easiest mission in the world to sell because everyone believes in kids getting access. Well, business world's promoting it. Susan Murray, how can ordinary families and community people support your work? I think being aware of it is one thing, yes. so I hopefully this conversation is one of the tools you use to acquaint our listeners and viewers, yeah. but what else can ordinary people do to support the work of Tickets for Kids? Yeah, well there's definitely a lot of ways. So number one, check out our website at mm -hmm. Uh, ticketsforkids.org as well as our social media pages. We're always putting opportunities on there for how people can get a little bit involved. Um, and then a lot of it is just speaking to other people. We want to become a household name. We want to make sure that everybody is aware of our mission. So there's lots of different ways. Yes, we get tickets from these institutions, but individuals can donate tickets too. So mm -hmm. if you ever have tickets to a mm -hmm. ball game mm -hmm. or a theater performance that you can't use, mm -hmm. we can put kids in those seats that wow. would have never had that experience. Mm -hmm. and, and what if families want to go somewhere but just don't know how to get there? Do they call you or call the neighborhood organization? How do they yeah. get 
in, in queue. Yep. Yeah. yep, so in order to be able to distribute as many tickets as we possibly can, we'll do at least 30,000 in Minnesota this year. We mm -hmm. partner specifically with nonprofits, mm -hmm. schools, and government agencies. Mm -hmm. So a great way for families to get involved is get involved in your no local nonprofits, whether that's stopping in at a Boys and Girls Club or a mentoring program or even one of the um, community centers. So we mm -hmm. work right now with almost all of the Minneapolis Park and Rec Centers, mm -hmm. hoping to create the same relationship with the St. Paul Rec Centers mm -hmm. um, to get these opportunities out there. So we try to make them as available as possible. Um, schools, nonprofits, government agencies can go to our website and mm -hmm. learn how to sign up to participate in the program. One of the things that I think is a little bit most shocking about this is mm -hmm. there's no cost associated with it. That's wonderful. We get all the tickets at no cost. We distribute all the tickets to these agencies at no cost whatsoever. So, of course, in order for our ability to expand the program, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm proud of 30,000 tickets a year. That's great. But we know that there's 200,000 kids in Minnesota every year who are food insecure. Mm -hmm. And we know that they're also not going to the zoo. Right. They're not going to ball games if they can't afford food, right? Mm -hmm. So in order for our mission to be able to reach as many kids, we need the financial support as well to be able to build up the infrastructure to do that. So that's obviously some way that people can contribute. Let's give the website. Yeah. So it's www.ticketsforkids.org. Susan, Mary, thank you so very much. Continued success in your program. I'm excited. You know, I love that uh, this is a way that brings the community full circle, full cycle, where you have uh, arts organizations and community organizations, you have companies, mm -hmm. you have businesses that are promoting an event, yes. and you have parents and families that uh, get a chance to enjoy those events by being a part of community organizations. Exactly. Everything fits in place. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Thanks to Susan Mary, who's the Regional Director of Twin Cities for Tickets for Kids. Now, if you like this conversation, uh, like us on Facebook and share uh, this program. We want to deliver what we call robust conversation. I think this certainly qualifies. Susan, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. This edition of Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by Comcast, working to bridge the digital divide through internet essentials and partnering with organizations across the Twin Cities to help make our region an even better place to live, work, and play. I'm pleased to have for this segment uh, leaders uh, of the important organization uh, United Heroes League, what a name, first of all. I, I love the name, but United Heroes League has a mission of keeping military kids healthy and active through sports. Uh, United Heroes League actively works to ensure that children of military service members can be afforded every opportunity to participate in sports. Uh, they've provided over $10 million worth of free sports equipment game tickets, cash grants, sports camps, and special experiences to military families across the U.S. and Canada. I'm pleased to have at the studio today Edwin Adricula, who's Vice President of Operations for the organization, and Molly Cashman, Director of Communications. Molly, Edwin, thank you both for being here. Thank you so much thank for having you. us. Let's start at, at uh, United Heroes 101. <laughs> <laughs> so tell the story, Edwin, I'll go to you first. Uh, uh, the vision, the work, the mission is what? Uh, so our main mission is to uh, we serve military families, and we do that by uh, giving children, military kids, uh, the opportunity to stay active and healthy through sports. Um, you know, there are uh, numerous uh, families that have people that are have parents that serve in the military, and you know, children they experience deployments just like the service members as well. Uh, there is anxiety, there is depression when their their mother or father are. Are, are overseas and, and gone for a long period of time. Um, and we try to keep them uh, busy and, and active through sports, and, you know, as far as uh, exercise and, 
and just being part of a team. Jump in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. So yeah, we. Um, I think a cool niche that we have is there are a lot of different programs that serve veterans and active service members, but we really, um, although we do serve them as well, we really want to focus on the kids as well. Mm -hmm. um, like Ed said, they serve right alongside their parents and they go through the same stresses and um, they never sign the dotted line, but they still go through it. So we really try to focus on the kids and give back to them and keeping them healthy and active. Well, I'm looking at your website and uh, uh, one of the uh, channels or panels on your website talks about the family, so it's very, Cool. You say that there are over five million uh, military kids who are serving alongside their parents each day. And I think that we don't appreciate that enough. Ordinary people that are not in the military or that have left don't reflect on this um, service that we really are asking for the entire family. It's not just uh, the man or the woman that's uh, signed up and being deployed, but that entire family really is signing up and we have to recognize that and support them. And you say at your website that uh, according to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, deployments for military members in the U.S. have increased in both frequency and length over the past 10 years. And as a result of these deployments, many children from military families have experienced absences of one or both parents and more than two million U.S. children have been affected directly by a parent's deployment. So your mission is to keep these military kids active and healthy through engagement and sports and experiences. What have you found out? How important is that uh, connecting children and families to sports and entertainment? Um, well, and I'll speak for myself, I'm a veteran as well. I've served 24 years in the Army and the Army National Guard. Um, I have four children, I've been married, uh, so I understand what it's like for those, uh, those service members that are, that are separated by their families. Um, and just living that through my children, um, as far as me being away at times, not only for deployments, but long training exercises and so forth, um, they just get used to it, you know, every year. Uh, so I know through sports and the special experiences that we have, um, my, I'll make, give you an example. My youngest, my nine-year-old Nathaniel, loves the Vikings. Mm -hmm. Just loves the Vikings. So, you know, every opportunity he gets, he, he'll participate in a game or whatever. And if if uh, if we can uh, provide an, an opportunity for him to meet a Vikings player, I mean, he he's all about it. So, <laughs> you know, it's those experiences that you can get, you can share with them, mm -hmm. um, and and those are the memories that we we get to keep. And you actually work with getting kids to play as well, right? Yes. And supporting their being actually active in sports. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that work? What do you do? Yeah, so we actually have five different pillars of giving. Mm -hmm. The first being sports equipment. So although we're local to Minnesota, we ship to all 50 states, as well as I think it's over 10 countries now where we're deployed. Um, and so head-to-toe equipment in seven different sports now. So that's the first thing. The second thing is what cash. Is that, what does that mean? You mean like helmets and? Yep. So helmets. So it actually baseball started. Baseball bats. Yep, uh, gloves. Uh, any type of equipment. Yep. We have a warehouse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So actually, people from Minnesota can come down to our warehouse in Hastings mm -hmm. and have access to it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, yeah. So we do. We ship equipment free of charge, and then we also do cash grants, which we're actually in our spring cycle for that right now. Mm -hmm. So. We have lots of military families that just need help financially keeping their kids in sports. So we offer fall and spring grants. Um, we are also doing a lot of sports camps. So we give them free access to these different camps all over the nation actually. Um, and then we also are getting more into special experiences. So um, we actually just sent four service members and their child to the NHL All-Star Game. Hmm. Um, for kind of a red carpet experience sure. and yeah so that was that's a lot of fun and then just sports tickets in general to kind of get their mind off of mm -hmm. the financial it can be very expensive to take a mm -hmm. whole family to a Timberwolves game or yeah. something so we supply them with tickets that's, for events that's too. That's so rich. Yeah. Uh, Ed, thank you for your service first of all. I, I, I'm a Navy veteran so I'm not holding oh. being in the Army against you. <laughs> <laughs> Friendly rivalry. But, but, uh, but thank you for what you've done. I think it's so important uh, that uh, you and that we uh, just talk about how uh, critical 
uh, service is and how it really is important to support families and talk about how beneficial it is for individuals to have a chance to serve the company, the country, mm -hmm. but also to recognize the, the cost is greater than the energy and time of the person. It does involve the entire family. Mm -hmm. And I think you've done that with United Heroes. You're saying, you know what, let's pay special attention to all the support systems that make this man or woman able to deploy and to know that his family's gonna be uh, at least thought about by the community. Definitely. Do you get feedback to, about that at all from people that you're working with? Yeah, you know, um, throughout, throughout the year, uh, you know, like Molly said that, we will give out game tickets. And, you know, families are just so appreciative of uh, given that opportunity to be able to take the entire family to a Twins game or to a Timberwolves game. Um, you know, and we've been fortunate enough to have uh, pro athletes as our ambassadors. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they, some of them will take the time to just come out and, and meet with family members and, and be able to just give back to the military community in, in their own little way. And that means so much to these, to these little uh, military kids and stuff. You know, they get to meet their, their, uh, their professional athlete as heroes mm -hmm. as well that they look up to. I'm looking at the website again. It says that 84% of the U.S. military is comprised of enlisted service members and that the financial burden of sports equipment and camps uh, of association dues can really uh, gobble up 10% of gross salary. It's expensive, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, the contributions that people can make to support this work really mean a lot. And so you have companies that support you, but individuals can support you as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to pass the opportunity for you to make the invitation yeah. for our listeners and mm -hmm. our readers and, and our viewers to mm -hmm. come to your support, to support mm -hmm. of uh, our country athlete. Yeah. So what do people do if they want to support United Heroes? Yeah, so there's actually a lot of different ways you can get involved. Um, as simple as donating your time. We do have a volunteer. If you go to our website, you can sign up to be a volunteer. Um, but we also accept donations of sports equipment, so any like old, gently used equipment you have, you can either ship it to us, drop it off at our warehouse, or we have a few pickup locations throughout the Twin Cities. Um, but also monetary. I think what's really cool about our organization is that there's always going to be someone that we can help. There's really no gap to or cap to what we can do and who we can access and help. There's, like you said, five million people that we can help mm -hmm. um, year after year. So I think um, it's very important. And what we do, there's so many families that are so appreciative. So really anything, mm -hmm. um, anything helps. How does a company like, uh, like Comcast support your work? Mm -hmm. uh, they work with a lot of community organizations through Internet Essentials, but there are other things they do. What do they do with you? So they definitely have been a great supporter for a long time now. Um, I think the cool relationship that we have with Comcast is that they really care about our mission and see our value. It's not just donations. Mm -hmm. A couple weeks ago, we actually had a few Comcast members in our warehouse looking at things, see how we run, um, which just really means a lot to know that they see the value in our mission and they want to help us. And we look forward to continuing to work with them. Um, you could speak a little bit on just the kind of how they've helped us in terms sure. of... Um, I know that they have started uh, the Internet Essentials. Mm -hmm. um, there is a military discount for, mm -hmm. for military service members um, to get cheaper uh, high-speed Internet. Mm -hmm. um, they talk about the digital divide. You know, nowadays you can't apply for a job without being on the Internet. You have to get online. Um, you know, you have to be able to have the resources to be able to apply for jobs. To You know, even with my children, I have four children, their all their homework is online. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, my oldest who goes to the University of Minnesota Duluth, the communication is email. Mm -hmm. You know, so unless you're online and 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 have that that high speed internet, um, yeah, you're left behind. You have to catch up with everyone else. So Ed, you told me about your being a veteran, uh, and uh, Molly, what's your story? How do you come to this work? Are you a veteran as well? No, I'm actually not. <laughs> okay, um, right. So well, yeah, you could be. Yeah, yeah, I could be. Yeah, I could yeah. be. Yeah. So I'm actually 22. I just graduated from the College of Saint Benedict last Con spring. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So um, when I was on the job hunt, I kind of went away from just applying blindly to jobs and I wanted to find an organization that really stuck out to me and I found United Heroes League and reached out to the owner Shane and 
just sent him a message on LinkedIn, so internet again, and um, just said that I love your mission. I've played sports my entire life, and I have family members, really good friends in the military. So it was like the perfect kind of mixture. It's been a very rewarding job, a fun one right out of college, and it's been, it's been great. Does your job cause you to travel from time to time to some of the other organizations or affiliate locations? Or are you sure. guys basically right here in Minnesota nope. only? Um, I, probably about a month ago, two months ago, I was in Anaheim. Uh, the Anaheim Ducks had done a, uh, uh, an event, um, and I was there to, mm -hmm. to support and to uh, represent United Heroes League. So, um, yeah, there's, there's times that we'll, we'll go across uh, the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. We have some future events coming up in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. um, San Diego. So, yeah, we, when we have to, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get over there. Okay. So we're down to a couple of minutes to uh, finish the segment. I want to give more time for people to know how to connect with you guys, how to weigh in and to support your important work. If people want to learn more, how do they do it, Edwin? Uh, what do they do? Or uh, Molly, either one of you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our website is a great tool. Um, there's a lot of different things. Again, you can become a volunteer, you can donate, you can check out our future past events. Uh, another thing is social media. We have Facebook, United Heroes League, Twitter, and Instagram. So give us a follow and we update that frequently on what we're up to. Um, yeah, I just think also just recognizing the people in your life, military service members and their families to not forget the sacrifices that they all make. So, Edwin, when did the organization start? I didn't ask that. How, oh, how, how did it start? Uh, United Hero League is, is 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, it started off as Defend the Blue Line. Mm -hmm. um, so Shane uh, Hudello is the, the founder and president. Uh, he's a huge hockey fan, so that's where it all started. Mm -hmm. um, his, his love for the, the sport of hockey hockey could be very expensive mm -hmm. um, and we do have that warehouse where you can come in and we will equip a uh, military child uh, from head to toe from the skates to the sticks to the helmet to the gloves everything and they could leave there with with no charge that's amazing mm -hmm. yeah so um and like you mentioned before 84 percent of um enlisted and most of them are junior enlisted mm -hmm. so uh they don't make a lot of money mm -hmm. and if you have a family of three or four that all play hockey that could get pretty expensive sure. you know and and they're just not paid enough to be able to to support all three or four children if they have that and they could just come to us and we'll be able to to uh, supply that listen i want to thank both of you for being here uh it goes fast Time it does, it does. You know. but you know what what you what you do is so important it's so critical and i want to thank you personally for uh the organization for what you're doing to support military families and kids in military families. And I think this discussion moves that uh, support broadly in the public, so I'm glad that you're here Definitely. to talk about it. Thank well, you so I'm glad. much. Yeah, I know you that so you're much. a veteran as well, so yeah. you understand I, what it's like. Mm -hmm. I absolutely you know, for these understand. Families, so that's important. And, and you know. even saying that, when I say that and in, in, in the same breath, uh, encourage people in my community to join the military. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important resource opportunity and mm -hmm. pathway for individual development and for the development of our country and for humanity, really. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. So I applaud you and, and myself and all of us who have chosen to serve, and I encourage others to do the same. But I think it's critical to take the extra step that you're doing with, with United Heroes to make sure that the families are all uh, embraced and supported as well. Definitely. Guys, thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Now, if you like this conversation, this content, follow us on Facebook, share this, and uh, tell people to check us out. Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. Support for Conversations with Al McFarland was provided by Old National Bank. Comcast. Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company.